Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Tanya. We are on chapter, end of chapter 43. We are on page 561, I believe. Yes. Um, we almost finished this chapter. We are, we have um, elaborated on the uh, Ava and Yira, love and reverence for Hashem. We, we introduced that there is the lower level reverence there's a higher level of reverence. There's a lower level of love and the higher level of love. Um, as he calls it, Ava Rabba, not just the higher level, but he calls it the great love, um, which is the love where you don't love Hashem because you are so inspired by Hashem's creation or Hashem's doing or Hashem gives you, but the love is, is, is totally a a undiluted, passionate love for the very essence fact that you love Hashem regardless of Hashem's greatness. In other words, it's not by some external benefit that I love Hashem, but I am just by the very fact that Hashem is who Hashem is, um, that I melt in this ecstasy of love in the, in, 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 in the very fact that of Hashem's existence, which is a very high level, which comes typically after the higher level of reverence. And we said, and this is really critical, that everything is all good and fine, but the, the observance and the action of the mitzvot actually come before, um, bef before anything. That is the, this is the most critical part. If we do, if we express our reverence and love without the observance, we have missed out of the entire um, idea of our connection to Hashem. Um, so we said it begins with the lower level of reverence. It goes, to the, it goes from there to, um, to the higher level of reverence. And from there we go from the, um, from the um, to love, from the lower level of love to higher level of love. But the question is in, in which order and where does action begin? Because we said in chapter 40 and 41 that our <clears throat> initial, our initial um, beginning of service has to be reverence, which we call Kabbalah's O, which means I need to accept Hashem's authority, Hashem's presence. Are we in Hashem's presence before I begin doing the mitzvah? And then I need to elevate my reverence. It should be a reverence of fear. It should be a reverence of standing in the honors of Hashem. And then that develops a love for Hashem. And the love for Hashem goes deeper and deeper. But what point do I do the mitzvah? Do I wait till I have all these meditations of reverence and love until I actually start putting on tefillin or eat the or eat the challah do hamotzi? Or do I where where in that four step process do I come in? It's going to explain this here in um, page on page five five sixty one section five. Why observance must come before love? We have now established that the higher level of great love will always be preceding, preceded by higher reverence. But does the, the lower level of worldly love come before or after the lower re reverence? So in other words, is it lower reverence, higher reverence, lower love, higher love, or does it go lower reverence, lower love, higher reverence, higher love? Which, in which order do we go? Especially, we, served, we learned last week that, the, in a sense, the higher reverence, the higher love, especially the higher love, is not the work of the Benini. It's something that only a tzaddik can, can reach. So let's continue. In chapter three, we learned the general principle about meditation. When the cognitive power of your rational soul focuses deeply on the greatness of God, a sensation of awesome reverence will be born in your mind. And after that, your heart will be ignited with a rapturous love, reverence of God, it would seem must always precede love of God. The, however, as Tatania will now know, there are no occasional, except, there are occasional exceptions to this rule. So now, so typically the rule is, I meditate of, you know, he says the cognitive power of your rational soul. It's, 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 it's a, there's a whole debate that in Tanya, we never really talked about this, that in a sense, Tanya touches about a third soul. Talked about a godly soul, 
talk about an animalistic soul. There's also something called what, 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 what he calls in chapter three, the cognitive soul, the rational soul. Mm -hmm. The rational soul. In, in, uh, in uh, Tanya, in the Hebrew, it's, 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 it calls it the nefesh ha-sichlis or nefesh ha Sichlis from the word seichel. Power of thinking is, is not a physical power, it's a spiritual power, the ability for the brain to think. So who's thinking? Is it the godly soul thinking? Godly soul is, is, is transcends the power of thinking. It's much higher than that. Animal soul, maybe it's even too low. An animal doesn't have cognitive powers as humans have. So there's a certain element, there's a certain element called the cognitive soul. In typically, typically, when it comes to humans, we, we peer together with the animal soul. Because at the end of the day, even the cognitive soul is self-oriented. It's not godly oriented. Just a little, a, a little, um, you know, you come to a restaurant, they give you a little, uh, little taste of the menu. Which makes for another for, for good talk. Anyways, but what is it saying? My cognitive soul, my animal soul thinks, has the ability, and that's what ability, the ability to actually think about Hashem, the greatest of Hashem, we utilize the physical world. And we don't start by meditating about the world of Atsilos and spiritual worlds. I meditate about the mountains, about the ocean, about God's creation, which is, which is physical in nature, which my mind can, um, can comprehend, you know, I always say science is the greatest meditation for 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 reverence and love for Hashem. The more the more you 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 um, study science, the more incredible, awesome you see how how, how awesome create creation deserves. Right? <clears throat> it's, it's it's a mistake that science is a is a is a uh, contradiction to Hashem. That's the biggest mistake, and, and it's like kind of like the, the given. It's like, oh, I, Rabbi, I'm not religious. I'm I'm scientific. I have a scientific mind. Like, I don't have a scientific mind. Like, what's <laughs> like, what's the one with the other? On the contrary, I when I see that how a baby is born, right, the, and the signs of it, and every moment of a of of a, of a childbirth, of of pregnancy, of conception. You know, uh, from nothing, uh, there's a little uh, from something. Nothing comes a uh, comes a full human being, and by a few weeks into, it, there's a brain developing, and and then a heart pumping, and lungs. Just the science of it is just incredible. That's where the, 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 there is Hashem right there. The Hashem has made this happen. Every detail. It's the greatest miracle. Don't. How, how can you even say that this just happens? by science I mean, how does it work from nothing a human being that thinks and feels comes to be that's the greatest miracle of all so so my point again cognitive cogn your cognitive soul soul means typically the power to be right the life source gives me the meditation that they utilize the universe and the creation of hashem to create the awe the fear, the reverence of Hashem, which is the lower reverence of Hashem, which brings me then to, to um, from there it goes to, after it says, the heart will be ignited with love, because if I have the awesomeness of Hashem, I love Hashem, but it not always has, it has to be that in, that in that order. It can be sometimes where the order is the other way around, right? As he said over here, however, we are bottom of 561, good morning, Pat. Uh, three paragraphs on the bottom. Uh, however, as a tiny would now know, there are occasional exceptions to this rule. And this worldly love can occasionally precede lower reverence. Usually, reverence must precede love because your soul needs to weaken its attachment to worldly pleasures through reverence before it can come to love God. But technically speaking, either emotions, reverence, or love could come first, as a tiny would now explain. Depends on the type of das which gives rise to it. As it's known in Tanya, for Das contains the potential for both Chesed and Gvura powers. What is Das? We learned in the earlier chapter. Das is the mind that connects to the idea. Hence, what type of meditation basically you're, 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 you're implying, which corresponds to love and reverence, respectively. And sometimes the Chesed power will come down and be disclosed first. 
Yes, so chesed, which is kindness, is connected to love. Gevur, which is strictness, is, is connected to reverence, correct? Now, the, the, the chesed, gvura, love and, and, and kindness and strictness or discipline is the emotion that is a result of my meditation, of my das meditation. So it depends what, which meditation I'm, 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 I'm implementing. Usually, we have to work our way up the hierarchy of the spheres. We, we begin with accepting God's authority in Malchus, then work up the reverence, gvura, which is followed by love, chesed. But Das bypasses strict linear pathway since it has parallel circuits to both Chesed and Gvura. So in the 10 Sephiros, which is the tree of life, the tree of the, the human, uh, so the, 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 the tree of life has, right, the Chachma bin Adas, Chesed is right, Gvura is left, and Malchus is the lowest of all the 10 Sephiros. Malchus means kingship. A Malchus comes not just from kingship, also means to accept. When we say kabbalat all, when I said the word kabbalat all, which means accepting, all means the yoke. So there's two words, there's, there's a word that follows that, that I don't use uh, all the time. Kabbalat all, shamayim, accepting the yoke of heaven. Aaron. Or kabbalat all, malchus shamayim, accepting the yoke of the kingship of heaven. So Malchus, which is kingship, from the word Melech, right? Melech HaOlam, Malchut, is the kingship, is, and the Sephira is the lowest level. We have Chachma, Bina, Das, Chesed, Gvura, Tif Eres, Netzach, Hot, Yisod, Malchus. So Malchus is number 10, it's the lowest level. You think that kingship should be the highest level, right? So it's, it's, it's actually, it doesn't refer to just Hashem, it refers to accepting Hashem, Kabbalah Zohar Malchus, meaning that it's, it before emotions, before uh, thinking comes into place, it's accepting, reverence. So typically, it's, it, you can go from the bottoms up, you go from top to bottom. So if I go from bottoms up, when I start my day, I accept Hashem, and that brings me, if I go up the ladder, I go through all those different um, emotions. That brings me to connection, which is your soul. That brings me to netza, which means me to be completely dedicated. And then it comes to first gevura, which is reverence or strictness, and then avon, then chesed, and then love. And then it comes to chachma binadas. But if I start with das, if I start from the top, which chachma binadas, meaning I don't start with malchus, with acceptance, I start with meditating about Hashem's greatness. Now, what comes first? Now it's not about, oh my gosh, Hashem's uh, authority and, and great, and, 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 and he's the king, but more how Hashem is great. I'm thinking about Hashem's greatness. Chachma bin Adas, really connect to the idea, which then comes chesed, kindness, love. Oh, now I love Hashem. Now the love Hashem comes first. So, that, so basically, Tanya says there is no um, typically first comes, we start typically start from the bottoms up because we are not uh, channeled, we're not Sadiqim. We always start with the greatest meditation. We start from Moda Ani Hashem am yours, Malchus, right? And then we go up the ladder. So which comes first? Yira comes first, reverence, and then Ava. But he says it's not, it's not the rule always. See, if you start your day with Das, with meditating, and then Abba will come first. That's also fine. Tina 562. We're in the uh, third paragraph. Good morning, Pat. Good morning, Rayo. Just joined. And now we have learned the, theor the, the theoretical reasoning why worldly love can precede lower reverence. Hania offers a practical illustration. This is really beautiful. And that's why it's possible for a Russia and a sinful person, right? Aren't they the same? <laughs> Russia and a sinful person. Isn't a sinful same. person Russia? Yes. Okay. Who lacks reverence to repent out of love, born in his heart, even without the initial feeling of reverence, 
as, as soon as she remembers God, his God. But could a person really repent and worship God with love alone? Chapter 41, we learn it's not sufficient to awaken love alone. You first need to awaken at least the inner reverence found dormant in the heart of all of Israel, not the act in sub in, in, in sub in sub towards the king, in it today? towards the king, the king of kings. So in other words, he says, so so that's the a a, a sinner has the ability to repent. Typically, a sinner or a Russia, and a sinner sounds harsh, but if we somebody we each make we each fall short and we do a sin, right? So the, the, the process of coming back of repentance typically is starts with what? With Euro, right? I either I feel um, fear of God that I did go I went against Hashem and there can be consequence, which is the lower level Euro, or I think about Hashem's um, awesomeness and how how uh, how I uh, how can I be distanced from Hashem, which leads me to to do repent to come closer to Hashem, or it can come out of the out of a a, a natural love that gets awakened within the sinner that I love Hashem, I did something wrong and I want to come back and I repent. So Tanya will answer. That even in the case of a sinful person who repents out of love, there must be some reverence present. However, even a sinful person who repents out of love isn't completely devoid of reverence, since reverence is automatically included in the love too. Because he was saying in chapter 41 that if we repent out of love and we lack repent out of reverence, it's not fully repentance. It's not fully considered complete shuva. That's why don't make don't go in the order of love to fear. Rather go from fear to love when you repent to Hashem. Then it's a complete package. But if you happen to come out of love, don't be so concerned because in the love there's also reverence it's included. Chapter 19, we learned the idea of reverence that contains in love. You love God so much that you cannot bear to do anything that would compromise your connection with Him. So even a simple person who repents out of love must have some residual reverence contained in his love. Meaning that I love Hashem so much and now I stand in reverence, I cannot be separated from Hashem. But why then does he feel only love and not reverence? Only his reverence is in a state of contraction and concealment. The person's reverence is dull and undeveloped while his love is powerful and overwhelming. His love eclipses his reverence, but the reverence is still there. Namely, his reverence is on the very basic level of the minimal reverence necessary to, to not to sin, not to act insubordinately towards God, God forbid, where his love is strongly palpable in his heart, heart and mind. It, it's, 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 that's, um, that can be the danger of, of when we, when somebody repents out of love for Hashem and doesn't focus on actually um, committing, you know, it's, um, I would say reverence here is, is a commitment. Love is an expression of attachment. All right, so I, I, I love Hashem and I want to be attached to Hashem. Attachment doesn't always come with, with commitment. Commitment means I'm there, um, meaning I'm there and I uh, want to make sure that I don't fall up. So it's like climbing the mountain uh, I'm attached to the mountain climbing it, but you also make sure they have a harness that you don't fall off. So if you're only focusing, oh, I just want to climb the mountain because I love the mountain, it's easy to fall off. So in, in our service with Hashem, sometimes, oh yeah, I just love Hashem, I love Hashem, it's amazing, Hashem is great. And we don't, uh, we don't think in, in terms of commitment that one second, two days ago, I was the greatest sinner in the world. Right now, I wake up. Wow, love Hashem. I'm like hey, Hashem is the best. Baruch Hashem, everything great. But I don't focusing. How can I improve myself internally? Make sure that I don't listen to my evil inclination. So two days later, from the high, I can fall out very fast. That's why we say people who go go really fast up, they go very fast down. Right? Be careful. Because and it's, sometimes it's it's not, it's 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 the excitement, the passion, 
you wanna you wanna you wanna make sure that they internalize that when the passion is not there, are they committed to the are they committed to the relationship? That's the balance of the three souls. Correct. So the third one you're talking about, the rationale tempers the emotional. Exactly. That's exactly. The, yeah. And here comes the interesting story. Very famous story in Thomas. Um, Tanya now notes that while we have seen that it's possible for love to precede reverence, such a case is unusual and exceptional. However, this phenomenon of love preceding reverence is, is unusual and it's an, uh, it's an emergency measure of divine providence due to the need of the hour. Sometimes, you know, when there's no other, other choice and the person is in such a bad shape that the only thing is you gotta, you gotta invoke just the love for Hashem as in the story of Rabbi Elazar ben Dordaya, who was extremely sinful, but eventually had an awakening and repented. But in the normal sequence of worship, it was a wild story of Rabbi Elazar. We'll, we'll maybe pull up the, the Talmud, we'll show you what, what, who this Rabbi Elazar ben Dordaya was. Well, let's finish up the chapter. But in the normal sequence of worship, which is fixed and determined by man's free choice, love would only come after Torah observance. And, 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 and you must first observe Torah and mitzvahs through lower reverence, at least with its, its minimal contracted state, and turn away from evil and do good, so as to shine the light of Torah mitzvahs into your divine soul, and only after can the light of love will God shine on you. In order to love God, you first need to internalize some of the light of the Torah and mitzvot, lower reverence, therefore leads uh, to Torah indirectly. Low reverence is necessary for Torah observance, which is necessary for love of God. For the Ahafta has twice the numeric value of or light as known to the master of hidden Kabbalistic wisdom. The fact that the Ahafta has twice the numeric value of light of or hints to the above point that the path to truly loving God requires two components, two lights. You can't just have love one single light you first need to attain the light of Torah and mitzvahs, and that will lead you to the light of love for God. Um, so again, the, what, is, what does Torah and mitzvahs have to do all, with all of that? What's the, what's the, what, what's the point of the, uh, of, of, how is he explaining here, right? In order to love Hashem, you may, need to first internalize some of the light of Torah and mitzvahs. Why? It's a roadmap. If you can't follow the map, you can't get there. So is it is it is it the it's a, is it about the roadmap? I think so. That's my opinion. It's a prescription. It's just different words, same thing. The the means to the end. <laughs> So in, 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 addition, in addition, we talked about the Torah mitzvahs is, is, is really a connection, right? These are the connectors. How do we express our reverence to Hashem? By, 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 by observing the commandments. If, if, if I don't follow the, the commandments, then my reverence is not, is not, is not genuine. It's, 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 it's self-made. In other words, I, 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 he can't come to a king and says, King, I, I'm standing in full of awe, but I'm not, I'm not going to follow your instructions, right? Then that's not true reverence. So, so, so on a very basic level, Torah mitzvahs is I got to accept. If I like it, I don't like it. If it's comfortable, not comfortable. If I understand it, I don't understand it. I got to accept these are the rules of, of the king. And I accept. Kabbalat, all Malchus I accept the yoke of heaven that whatever he wants me to do, I can keep kosher, I keep kosher. And that's the foundation of every mitzvah, really. I think we learned in that last week's parsha when the Jewish people said, Naaseh venishma, we will do and we will listen. We will do, Yira, right? And then came, listen, which is really Chachma or Das, to meditate on them. Didn't say la, nishma. Let's listen. Let's do das, and then we will develop through, uh, the, the reverence, and we'll do it. The true commitment is doing Torah mitzvah. That's the lower level of of of, 
of reverence, but also the lower level of doing the mitzvah, which has to be always the foundation. I also want to understand and do the mitzvah, the meditation part, where the mitzvah in itself has an infinite value, as we learned in the other chapters. Each mitzvah connects us to the essence of Hashem, the essence of the will of Hashem. So it's not just doing it out of fear, out of reverence, because God told me to do so, but much more than that, because with that, I express my love and commitment and connection to the essence of Hashem, to the essence of my soul. But if you don't have that in the process, there is no, there is no, there is no, there is no path forward. There is no true reverence. So reverence comes right after reverence comes to our mitzvahs. Now he's adding here in the end a little bit more of a Kabbalistic idea, mystical idea, that not only does it do expression of my commitment of reverence to Hashem, but the fact when I do Torah and mitzvahs, I internalize the light of it, or, right? Because what is Ahava? What is love? She says that the numeric value of Ve'ahavta, the mitzvah we say in the Shema, Ve'ahavta, you shall love Hashem, the numeric value is two times or two times light, right? Or is, is a, or is Aleph above Resh. Aleph is one, Vav is six, Resh is 200. So or is the 200 and um, 200 and what? 207, right? Aleph above Resh is 207. The Ahafta is 414. Vav, Aleph, He, Vav, Tav. It's 414, which is two times 207, two times the letter, the Hebrew word of or, which is light. How do you express your deep love for Hashem when you incorporate it truly Torah and mitzvahs, not just out of reverence, but now you connected it in a way that you're expressing the mitzvah, doing it out of love for Hashem, not only out of reverence for Hashem. That's the, that's the sequence. Very cool, very fun. What is the story of Rabbi Elizabeth Durdaya? You want to know? Ready for a wild story? All right, we're going to switch. We're going to study Talmud now. How's that? <laughs> Bella, Be Bella, our, our Torah scholar. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're doing okay. Nazir now. In Nazir, all right. So now there's, now there is the, uh, now we have, um, I'll show you how you can study Talmud very easy. And, and Bella can, has a very good class she attends. But today the Talmud is, is translated in English. And you go to a website called sefaria.org. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. And you'll click Talmud. You have all different texts over here. From sefaria. Sefaria. S-E-F-A-R-I. IA.org. All right, I'll put it in the chat box. You can um, I'll put you the link. All right. And then here you have Talmud, Tanakh, Mishnah, Medrash, Kabbalah, many, many thousands of different Jewish books that are all available online, all translated. I in Yeshiva did not have this, and this will make my Yeshiva uh, experience a lot easier. But also, it would make the long term much harder. Because if you feed the animal food without teaching the animal how to make the food, you'll never learn how to make the food. If you learn everything in English, you don't know actually how to learn from the source, then you never know how to translate it yourself. Anyways, just uh, now go to the Talmud, there's different tracted in the Talmud. But typically <laughs> the, the, the Talmud and the Mishnah, Mishnah is the backdrop of the Talmud. Mishnah was written before the Talmud. Mishnah has uh, different tractates. It's in six different categories. You see it says here on the top, Seder Zeraim, which are all the mitzvot that are connected to agriculture, which is number one. Then you have Seder Mod, which is all the mitzvot that have to do with the holidays, like Shabbat, Pesach, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Shoshana. And then you have the tractor called Nashim, which means family law, all the mitzvot that has to do with, with family life. life. A uh, ketuba wedding, a um, a gitin, which is the get divorce, um, bris, etc. Then you have 
a tractor called Nazikim, which are damages, which is mo mostly uh, legal, the legal law of damages, of property and liability, which is all over here, which is one of the most extensive one that goes later on in the Talmud. Then you have the last sections called, uh, last two sections, one is called sacrifices, which deals with all the sacrifices in the temple. And then you have the last one is called purity, which has to do with the mitzvot of purity in the temple, again with mikvah, etc. cetera. Um, now this is the Mishnah. Now quickly, I'm gonna to jump to the Talmud, which elaborates on the Mishnah. We're gonna to go to track over here, which says the story of the Nezmedaya is an attractive of Avoida Zara. So Avoida Zara means idol worship. The tractor deals with idol worship, which is in right over here, which is put into the category of, of, of the laws of damages. Um, and wow. you see that you see all these numbers. Wow. So you look at the Tanya, it says the story of the diet is in avoid the zero, page 17. 17a. I go to 17a, and now I'm going to go down to the story, and you can read it yourself. Um, right? Look, here's the, fam the famous, actually, the Talmud discusses um, about the uh, story about Jesus over here. It's in the Talmud, which was actually later on uh, censored by the, uh, by the church to take out these stories from the Talmud. Um, so, who was Rabbi Lazar ben Dodaya? Let's go to Rabbi Lazar ben Dodaya. All right. Here it is. So the, the Talmud, the, the, the Talmud says, um, it discusses the laws of repentance. And the Talmud there says that one who repents of the sin of forbidden sexual intercourse, um, he doesn't he doesn't die as a result if he repents properly. So the Talmud asks the question. I'm reading the Talmud. The Gemara asks, and is it correct that one who repents of the sin of forbidden sexual intercourse does not die? But isn't it taught in a brighter, which is another yes. Mishnah? It's said about Rabbi Lezab and Dodaya that he was so promiscuous that he did not leave one prostitute in the world with whom he did not engage in sexual intercourse. So one second, he wasn't he a rabbi? <laughs> okay. Rabbi Leza ben Dodaya was one of the greatest scholars and rabbis and, it's, and who fell very, very low. You see how low? Once he heard that there was one prostitute in one of the cities overseas who would take a purse full of dinars as her payment. He took a purse full of dinars and went and crossed seven rivers to reach her. When they were engaged in the matters to which they were accustomed, a, a euphemism for intercourse, she passed wind and said, just as this past wind will not return to its place, so too Elaza ben Dudaya, right? There's no more rabbi here, will not be accepted in repentance, even if he were to try to repent. Who's telling him that? The prostitute. The prostitute, right? She's so giving him a, a, a Torah class. <laughs> this statement deeply shook Elaza ben Dudaya, and he went and sat between two mountains and hills and said, mountains and hills, Pray for mercy on my behalf, so that my repentance will be accepted. They said to him, which by the way, mount, mountains and hills also refers to, in Hebrew, a mountain is harim. Uh, harim, harim and horim, horim are parents. So he was talking maybe not only to the mountain, but he was trying to reach his parents who were in heaven. And, and his parents told the mountains responded, um, 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 and, and said, Mountain Hill, pray for mercy in my heart so that my, repent my repentance will be accepted. They said to him, before we, may, we pray for mercy in your behalf, we must pray for mercy on our own behalf, as it stated, for the mountains may depart and the hills be removed. So um, he saw the mountains are not going to help him out. So who, who does he move on to? He said, Heaven and earth. And you have to remember, this is a guy who who's able to communicate with um, with very uh, different beings than just humans, right? And he's really bothered that he cannot do tshuva. So now he goes to heaven and earth, and, and he says, um, he said, heaven and earth, pray for mercy on my behalf. They said to him, before we pray for mercy on your behalf, we must pray for mercy on our own behalf. It stated, for the heaven shall vanish away like smoke. 
and the earth shall wax old like a garment, meaning the heaven and earth have their own issues to deal with. They're, they're not, they're not now, I'm not ready to, to, to put away um, ourselves and pray for you, Allah. He said, so he turns to whom? The sun and the moon. He said, sun and moon, pray for mercy on my behalf. They said to him, before we pray for mercy on your behalf, we must pray for mercy on our own behalf. It stated, then the moon shall be confounded and the, and the sun ashamed. He said, stars and consolation, pray for mercy on my behalf. They said to him, before we pray for mercy on behalf, we must pray for mercy on our own behalf. It stated, and all the hosts of heaven shall, shall molder away. So Lazar ben Dodaya said, clearly the matter depends on nothing other than myself. He, pl he placed his head between his knees and cried loudly until his soul left his body. Mm. The divine voice of merchant said, Rabbi Elizabeth ben Udaya is destined for life in the world to come. Um, so we'll stop away for a moment because this is a, so what does it mean? What's the point? That he recognized that repentance is not gonna come outside of him. It's gotta come from him. And he realized, so first of all, he had a, um, a vague awakening of what? Of, of repentance. Where did it come from? From reverence or fear of Hashem? Or love of Hashem? Fear. Um, I would say it came out of love for Hashem, not out of fear. Hmm. Um, why? Because he ran to these other places. But as a repentance, by its very definition, have the three components of it's got to be oral, out loud. Um, one has to be truly remorseful. And then one has to yes. be not to do it again. And that's where I kind of got lost in the beginning. If he repeats his sin, is he truly remorseful? Um, he, 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 he only starts to repent when the prosecutor tells him basically, you yeah. know, there is no, everybody has a path back to heaven except you. And that shook him to the core. Mm. He, he knew that he knew that, that, that sinning, there's consequence for sinning, right? So the coming back was what? When he was told there is no entry into heaven for you wasn't saying that you're going to be burning in hell. There was no entry for heaven, which to me means that he was, he, 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 he had this, he had this love for Hashem that he was awakened in him. And, and how do I see that from plainly reading the Talmud, the very fact that A, he, he was trying to get back into, into the kingdom and to heaven and to the world to come, he was looking for assistance. And when they told him there is no assistance, he took responsibility himself and he expired. He died from, 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 from the heartbreak that he cannot be connected to Hashem anymore. Or the Not fear. like, it doesn't talk about his, so much about the consequence of his action. Oh, the fear that he'll never make it. This is your last chance that you've gone too okay. far into okay. Here. Anyway, okay. It, it's, and it's isn't it? He, but isn't he, he his sin was punished by the heavenly court? Is that so, equivalent? So, so, so the 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 if we continue the the, the Talmud, um, I'll go over here. Well, um, we said that a divine voice emerged and said, "Of Elizabeth the Daya is destined for for life in the world to come." which the Gemara now, the Talmud says, explains the difficulty presented by the story. And here Rabbi Lazar was guilty of the sin of forbidden sexual intercourse, and yet he died once he repented. The Gemara answers, um, the, there too, since he was attached so strongly to the sin, to an extent that transcended the physical temptation he felt is similar to heresy, as it, it had become like a form of idol worship for him. And it's punishable. Yeah. So when Behuda Nasi heard the story of Elazar ben Uzziah, he wept and said, there is one who acquires his share in the world to come only after many years of toil. And there is one who acquires his share in the world to come in one moment. And Rabbi Yehuda Nasi further said, not only are penitents accepted, 
but they even called Rabbi, as the divine force referred to Eliza ben Azariah, as Rabbi Eliza ben, ben Dordaya. Um, this is a, is a classic Talmud, that there's so much ink spilled on this story. <laughs> And the Rebbe has a very beautiful insight in the story. I want to pull it up as well, so we can uh, kind of uh, get the Rebbe's insight in this. One second. Okay, so I found one source. Well, not, not the original text from the Rebbe, but I'm going to read it, show you here. Um, so again, the Gemara of Bazar relates a fascinating story concerning about Shuvah named Elizabeth Dodaya. For many years, he lived a, a fearless life, steeped in the morality. It said about him, there was not a person in the world that he has not visited. I'm going to skip here the whole, the whole time when we just read this over here. Um, it's over here. It seemed that once Elizabeth Dodaya decided to repent, it did not take him a long time to accomplish it. Why then did Rebbe say that one can earn this his world in Shah Echad in one hour? Why necessarily in one hour? No, that's not the one I wanted to talk about. Okay, here. Now that we have described the repentance of Elazar ben Odaya, one may rightfully wonder who was his personality. According to the Kabbalist, he was a reincarnation of Yochanan Kohen Gadol, who served for 80 years as a high priest in the second Beit HaMikdash and became a heretic at the end of his life. Elazar ben Odaya, with his brief realization and confession of truth, acquired the merits which Yochan Kohen Gadol lost after 80 years of a In only one hour of sincere attachment to Hashem, the neshama of Elizabeth and Adaya became worthy of eternal life. Um, there is, however, another beautiful, intriguing explanation given by Rabbi Huda Lowi, the famous Maral of Prague. In addition to the simple meaning that the Gemara relates to Elizabeth and Adaya agonizing experience, it could be said that the name Elizabeth and Adaya is an allegory. The word Elazar is a just position of two words. Kel Ozer, God helps. And Dodaya, which is in the language of the Talmud, Aramaic, is the, sed is the sediment which falls to the bottom of the wine barrel. So the episode, the episode is a metaphor to teach us that Elazar, Kel Ozer, God helps. Dodaya, the one who is compared to sediment. The one has fallen to the lowest level and is like the sediment that lost all its wine qualities. When it comes to realization that Ein hadava tola elo bi, it all depends on me. And I am the one who has to express sincere remorse and make the effort to change. When this incident was reported to Rabbi Huda, the prince, he used this unusual act of honest intro introspection and shuba as a text for a great moral lesson to his disciples. 
these are they are those who obtain the world olam haba with many years of work v'yesh chone olam b'sha echad and there are those who acquire the world in one hour in one brief instance of self-realization self-transformation on this great day of atonement this is Bad Yom Kippur. May we inspire to emulate the example of Azab and Dodaya. So, not every, today. Huh? No, not day, today. Every, every day. In essence, every day, the power of Chuba can bring you back, can bring you back all the way to, 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 to the state of, of, uh, of the way you were before or, or even greater. In other words, if it comes from an inner, transformation, because he said, it all depends on me. He took responsibility. And of course, it was all levels of tshuva, as Leona mentioned, acceptance. It was such a deep tshuva of repentance. That was acceptance, which is really um, um, and, and, and regret and, 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 and remorse. So deep that Hashem accepts that in an instant that you don't have to rewind your entire lifetime what you have done. So even a person like Elias Madai, if he existed, he didn't exist, it was a reincarnation or, or it's just a metaphor, somebody who, all, who went to the lowest of the lowest, he was a sediment, he has the ability, how so? Because Kel Ozer, because Hashem accepts the penitent, Hashem accepts the repentance. The moment it's sincere, you're good to go. That's Yom Kippur. We talk about Yom Kippur, right? But every day we, 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 we have the ability to do so. You don't have to wait till Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, you have a special uh, revelation from above that helps you. And, and then Kippur, really, you're down to the wire, right? It's like, it's like Elias ben Adaya. There's no way out. I'm going to die. If I don't today, I'm not going to shape up. I'm, what's going to be? All right, my friends. But we don't need to wait for Yom Kippur. No, no, absolutely not. Every day, every day, actually. Um, is, it, is it Psalms? I can't remember the scripture as far as the East is from the West. So shall I remember your sins no more? It's when, when we repent, like with that sincerity, with, with all our heart, and like the, then it is as far to God as the East is from the West. I forget the, where to find it, but. The line is there's no, nothing stands in the path of repentance and there's no distance. There's no distance that you have to overcome. Um, in a sense, the moment you dig into tshuva, into tshuva mode, which means you go deeper inside of you to your core essence of yinoshama, there's no more limits. Your soul is not limited in, in, in distance, in how many sins you have done. It's unlike like you will have to. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't diminish um, um, what you have done, that it's such an easy fix, right? It doesn't say you don't have to take responsibility, especially if it was done between people, right? You can't just repent. If you hurt somebody, you got to take responsibility and, and, and mend that, what you, what you made wrong. But it comes between us and Hashem, we have the ability to, to, to go from a very low to very high in, in, a, in a very fast way if it comes from the, from, from, the, from the core infinite part of our soul. So there's no east and west. There's no longer any, any, any consider any. Sometimes we think, oh my gosh, I'm so low. Right? Somebody once told me, Rabbi, I'm, I'm doing all these mitzvot and uh, tzedakah. I'm paying up for all my sins I did all my life. <laughs> I said, don't tell me what you have done. I don't want to hear. I was paying up because uh, it, it's coming out of guilt. It's not coming out of, uh, and it's not even, uh, guilt is not reverence either. It's, Isn't it's, it bad? Uh, we want to, we want to do tshuva. And that's called tshuva ma'ava, tshuva me'ira. Where does repentance come from? Does it come from the reverence or does it come from love? And it has to come from both. And within reverence, we learn. So when you come your kippah, why do you do this? I'm sorry, Hashem, why? Oh, because it's I'm getting my ticket today, right? It's that uh, my, my life is being decided. I want to have a good year. Sorry, Hashem, I'm sorry. That's like my kids, right? Who misbehave. Now they don't get the, the ice cream. They say sorry, and then they want the ice cream. I'm not truly sorry. <laughs> Most people, that's how we are being wired 
the guilt of Yom Kippur, we come to Shul, we got to be on the safe side, we got to have a good year. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, if we learn Tanya, that's a, uh, that's not a, that's very, very um, um, primitive. Anyways. But my point of bringing that up is the memory of God so that after God does not remember it. And so we don't need to carry it repeated and ruminate right. on our shortcomings. Right. That's, right. that was my purpose of bringing that up. Yes. I'll finish up with a, with a story in the, um, I think it was the previous Rebbe. Um, he was Yom Kippur by his father, who was the fifth Rebbe Chabad in Russia. And it was an incredible Yom Kippur with, you know, the, the intensive davening and the um, emotions of repentance went, uh, was, was in the greatest height. And the next morning, so Yom Kippur was over, and next morning, he comes to his father's study, says, "What, well, father, what is the service now? What's the avoda now? If avoda, Yom Kippur, is repentance, right? And you taught us in Tanya, repentance of Ava and Yira, and we, and we, we meditate and we daven on that. What's, what's, what are we going to do today, the day after, after the high? And he said in Yiddish, it's the daven, gar tshuva tam. Now we really have to do repentance. Now we really have to tshuva. What do you mean now? I just yesterday I was on the highest repentance level. What else I have to do today? Shuva, the word shuva it does not really mean repentance. Shuva comes from the word to return. And within returning means that I'm going up the ladder. I am and Shama came from the highest level of Hashem, and I am all the way down to this world, and I fell low in, 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 in whatever level I am. It's a constant daily service. Is tshuva is really going higher for where I am, where I was yesterday in my spiritual journey with Hashem. So the language is not about sin. We're not talking about sin anymore. That's a given. We're not talking about sin. Of course, if you have sin, take care, clean out, clean out the dirt, take care of that. But it, 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 it's going much higher. That's why it says that even a tzaddik has to do tshuva. Right? Mm -hmm. Even a tzaddik has to do tshuva. When Mashiach will come, we're all going to be tshuva. We're doing tshuva all what is his tshuva? What is his tshuva about? His tshuva is to is to elevate to a higher level within his love, within his reverence to go on a higher level. These are infinite levels within Hashem. There's infinite levels. So if the tzaddik has cleansed himself completely from any negativity, right? He has killed his evil inclination all day. He loves him and and loves Hashem. Now within love Hashem, there's 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 so much more to to love. There's so much deeper to go. Like if you learn in Kabbalah, for example, you learn in Tanya, right? You learn that you you learn one concept and you think, okay, now I understand the concept. Next week you know that behind this concept there's even a deeper concept, and now you feel even even yes. even, even greater, or you feel that there's more. And there's more, and there's more within Hashem. There's more and more and more. That's tshuva. That's tshuva. Means to keep keep climbing. The, the the ladder, and 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 that's what we're focusing on. Your know, keeper, not so much on the and, and 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 we're not focusing so much on the negativity, but more on the positivity, which is the uh, the whole Hasidic approach to tshuva. <laughs> Let alone the unconscious. So that's the conscious level, which is like seventeen percent of our mind, but tapping into that unconscious. To me, like Yom Kippur, then you can repent of what you don't even know, what isn't even conscious. It right. then that's the time of we can't even get to it, but it's there. <laughs> I have to run. I'm gonna keep. Uh, hope I want to keep climbing the ladder. <laughs> Thank you so much for this class. Thank you, Rabbi. And this lesson Thank taught you. me taught me a little lesson that pure love. To Hashem, it's much more higher than than to be scared and fear of Hashem. That's that's the the, 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 Rebbe, the Rebbe took all these stories from the Talmud and turned them around. And this is not really what I want to. I didn't find, but I'll find it. Especially some of them are recordings. There's a famous story of the um, when they destroyed the temple. Um, one of the uh, Kohanim, the family, of the Kohanim had a had a had a daughter. Her name was um, uh, was um, Bilga, 
Bas Bilga, daughter of Bilga, um, and she um, turned against Hashem. She married one of the Roman uh, soldiers or officers. She worshipped idols, and she came into the temple when it was destroyed and defiled the temple, and she took her shoe, and she hit the, the altar, the Mizbeach, and she cursed out Hashem in the Mizbeach, a whole fascinating story. And the Rebbe turned the whole story around that it was her neshama crying out to Hashem. How, 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 um, I, I'll, I'll find it for you. It's a fascinating, uh, it was a fascinating study. Um, all right. Thank Maybe. you, Rabbi. Thank you, Thank Rabbi. You. Yeah, all right. All the best, everyone. Good. <laughs>